This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail-order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. It's our last session of this year. I hope you've enjoyed it throughout the year. We try really hard to help you in many different ways. Obviously, the Garden Gurus TV show, it's all about inspiration, showing you the latest and greatest ideas. But this is all about answering your questions, which is what we're going to do today. If you've enjoyed this year's show and you're tuning in, maybe for the first time, let us know what you think. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to hit the like button. Now, today's show is jam-packed full of great information, and it is very much about you, so I do want you to be sending your questions in. But we will be talking about foraging. In fact, a little bit later on, we'll talk about how weeds are edible, and some of them incredibly delicious. I'm going to be joined by the co-author of the children's book, Let's Eat, we Let's Eat Weeds. It's Annie Razor Rowland. Uh, <laughs> to uh, chat about her book. It's a great book and it's a really good idea. It's a terrific Christmas present for kids and it's in bookstores at the moment. So we'll, we'll show you a little bit of that. Are you struggling with your native plants at the moment? Well, they've just come off one of the busiest times of the year as far as growth and flower goes. And there's something really important you need to do right now if you want to get some great results. I'll share some tips. And it's never too late to get the perfect gift for any green thumb. I've got a Garden Express offer. It is our last Garden Express offer of the year, and it is a ripper. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Of course, we've got prizes to give away. We've got our friends at Fothergill Seeds always send us through some seeds. So we'll be sharing some packet seeds. There's a couple of things that are really seasonal at the moment. Corn, I'm growing corn at home. I've got one crop coming through, one crop I'm about to start harvesting. Tomatoes, my tomatoes at home are magnificent. And over the next couple of days, we'll start shooting a brand new series of the TV series Delish with some very talented uh, chefs and also some personalities who've got some great recipes. And that's one of the plants that I'll be showcasing is just how good they can be this time of the year. Now, should we, uh, should we get into it? I think we should. Let's go to Queensland. Let's go to Rabina. I think it's Rabinia, isn't it? Um, Janet, hello. How are you? I've got a problem with my grevillea. It seems to be dying off. Now, the soil is for natives and is in a 15-month-old garden. What is wrong? That does seem like a big problem. Can I suggest you do one thing straight away? Make sure you get in around the base of your grevillea. Make sure you pull all the dirt away from the trunk. Usually when they start dying off, it's going to give you an indication they've got a collar rot, which is that rot around the cambium layer. So it creates a, effectively, it'll ring bark the tree or the plant, um, or it's a root disease, which is too much water. And generally in high humidity, sometimes you can end up with root rots. So I would suggest that that's probably the most likely issue. Um, what you could also do is you could grab this a product out there called Yates Anti-Rot, mix it up in a watering can, drench the soil. If anything's going to bring your plant back, that will do it. The only other thing you might need to do is just go through with your secateurs and prune off the dead bits. Prune them off, put them in a plastic bag, pop them in the bin. Don't put them in your compost bin. Just get rid of them all together. Hopefully that helps. Donna is in Kalgoorlie. Kalgoorlie is going to be pretty hot this time of the year. And Donna wants to know when is the best time to trim lavender? Well, Donna, it is not right now in the peak of the heat. What you'll see is you'll probably see towards the end of February, there'll be this sort of stringy sort of growth. It's the time to really start to get into it. And so February, March, give it a good prune, which means that sort of June, July, 
August, when it comes into flower, you are going to be getting the very best results. Never prune beyond the foliage with lavender. So don't go cutting down to that hardwood where there's no leaves left. It probably will not reshoot. So a couple little tips there. Um, with lavender, small amounts regularly is better than um, hard prunes once or twice a year. Chris, not sure where you're from, Chris. Folks, make sure you tell us where you're from. But Chris has sent us these photographs. Have a look at this. All right, Jimmy's going to pop them up on the screen for us right now. And this photograph, which we're not seeing, it's loading. It's coming, it's coming. We've got Robin and Jimmy in running the show today with Lachlan overlooking it. Um, but these photographs show a white fluffy insect and you can see quite distinctly little legs on either side of it, a tail. And um, this is a classic case of mealybug. I'm not quite sure what the plant is, Chris. Let's, let me go back and have a quick look. I'm not sure what it says. The plant does look like it might have also a little bit of uh, mite on it. Now, you're going to ask me what the best solution is uh, for something like this. And I would tell you that if you could get your hands on it, that um, Rich Grow's Bug Killer is what I would be shaking the granules around the base of it. Um, there are a few other treatments for mealybug available. Sorry, I shouldn't be doing that. See what I'm doing there? I'm looking at the picture. Um, but you can see it quite clearly there. Um, the, the, let's see if I can get close to it. Yeah, you can see the little white bugs there. Um, they are mealybug. And mealybug, if you let it get out of control, is a really significant problem because it gets into the root system, it gets into the axis of all the leaves and it causes a significant amount of damage, basically by just sucking the goodness out. So you want something systemic and uh, probably um, Bathroid Advanced, I would suggest is probably the one you'd go for. And if you can get that rich grow bug killer, it is very effective control of mealybugs, thrips and mites, which are all going to make themselves known to you in the next few months. So now's the time to start thinking about treatment. It's always better to be proactive sometimes. If you've got certain in, uh, certain pests that always come back, treat your plants now before you see the damage. And that way the plant will, uh, will not be set back. Okay, we are going to go, we're back in WA actually, in Parkerville. Greg has asked us, we recently planted a few natives ranging from eucalyptus, silver princess, some mallies and baronias. How much water should we be giving them? during the hot, because well, we are about to get a really hot spell here in WA. In fact, I think Christmas Day is going to be close to 100 in, in uh, the old old thing of 100 Fahrenheit. It's 38, somewhere between 38 and 40. That in a place like Parkerville could be 42. These plants do need to be watered. The most important thing is probably to make sure the water's staying in the soil. So mulch is very important. Greg, big chunky mulch up there is a good way to go. Um, and look, as far as water goes, probably, probably the best thing to do is to work on the two or three standard drinks a week. But when you get a really hot stinking day, get out with the hose and don't do it at night. Try and do it either in the early evening or alternatively go the other way. And that is go into, um, uh, sort of that sort of first thing in the morning and give them a drench give the ground a really good soaking if they're looking like they are a bit unhappy. Mary is in South East Melbourne. Hello, Mary. My fig tree only has a few leaves. Is there anything I can do to help her? I love figs. Um, it's very unusual that it only has a few leaves at the moment. It should be doing quite well. So Mary, feed, give it a good feed, a good all round complete fertilizer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest something really different here. So normally we'd be talking about fruit promoting fertilizers but interestingly enough figs aren't fruit they're a flower in fact they're thousands of flowers so when you go for a fertilizer maybe look for a specialist fertilizer like this so this is the osmocote and you can see it's a really strange thing for me to say but osmocote roses gardenias um what else have we got in there azaleas and camellias and this a good handful of this maybe even two handfuls if it's a larger plant um, is going to stimulate some pretty good flower. And that's what you want with figs, because of course the fig fruit is actually a flower. How's that for a good idea? 
All right, so let's keep moving on. I hope that helps, Mary. Lynn is in Claremont. We're back in WA. We're getting a very interesting mix of questions coming in from all over the country. Lynn in Claremont, you've got a 15-year-old crabapple tree which has just started setting up lots of suckers. Now, they're not coming from the main root system but from small runner roots close to the main trunk. I've tried slasher a number of times but they keep coming back. Can you please help me? Okay, so slasher is a herbicide. It's a bit of a, a burn her herbicide. So that's um, the first thing I'm going to say to you is you don't want to affect the health of your tree. Killing off the roots will do that. So you don't want to use a herbicide at all. The best thing you can do is let those runners get up a reasonable size, grab them with some gloves on and pull them away. Don't cut them. Pull them away. You blind all the buds and you'll stop any more coming through. What it does indicate is usually when... The, there's feeder roots that run across the surface of the soil. And what it's probably indicating is that they're right on the surface. So as soon as they come in contact with direct light, they'll start setting up um, growth shoots. Now, those suckers you don't want because they're not going to produce the same flower that you get out of your um, crab apple. So it might be time to even top dress the soil a little bit, um, get it nice and dark over the top of those roots and you won't get any growth buds up here. Hopefully that helps Lynn. It's quite a common problem this time of the year and just about all of the grafted plants will be setting up suckers of some sort now. So think about you know your roses, your fruit trees, all of those will be showing some sign of sucker growth. Time to pull it away. Don't cut it. Pull it away. They won't come back. Sandra is on the central coast of New South Wales. Hello. Wondering what native wildflowers are best to plant in my native garden. Well, look, Sandra, I would suggest just at the moment you'd Probably only think about your grevilleas, Cerapetlum, the New South Wales Christmas bush. I wouldn't be going for any of the proteaceous plants at all. So um, I would be thinking that the waratahs definitely not. My suggestion is that you actually hold off and wait until uh, probably about April. That's about the best time in New South Wales to get planting, in central coast of New South Wales, to get planting with a lot of those natives. And if you can start off with small plants, get them into, into the ground. You know when they're grown in a tube that's always good quality soil. So make sure they've got good quality soil in the ground and that gets them going and then they can adapt slowly to the, the native soil that they're going to be growing in in the future. Hopefully that helps. Staying, no, we don't know where Elizabeth's from. Hello, Elizabeth. Why do my roses keep getting black spots? Two reasons. One is your roses are not strong enough, so you need to be boosting their growth and you need to be making sure that the fertilizer you're using has a complex um, base set of trace elements. It's really important. How do you do that? When you, okay, we'll go back to this one. When you look at your container, you'll see it's got an ingredients list. It shows you what is actually in that fertilizer. And when it's a very comprehensive list, it's giving you the, the very full mix of all the different types of nutrients that you need. It's a really important thing that you get a very complex diet. Now, this is gonna make the plant stronger and able to ward off some of those things. The second thing, Elizabeth, is they need to have good ventilation and never let them have water on their foliage at night. You get water on the foliage at night, if you're running your sprinklers at night, if you're hand watering at night, and that water sits on the foliage overnight, you will get big black spot outcrops it really does make a big difference. So please don't do that. It's a big rule for everybody. And folks, if you've got veggies, don't run your veggie garden sprinklers um, at night if you are growing cucurbits. So any of the melons, any of the cucumbers, pumpkins, because it'll just encourage that um, powdery mildew growth on the foliage if you do that. Okay, shall we keep rolling along? Um, Valerie is in Perth. Hello, Valerie. How are you? I've got an orange tree, a mandarin tree, an olive tree, and a frangipani. Can I plant them over sewage or will roots break sewage? So the question is, is the sewage septic or is the sewage proper sealed um, plastic piping with no leaks? As long as you've got no leaks, you can grow anything over the top of them. You don't want to grow a plant directly on top of any pipes at all, no matter what they are. But, um, the, you know, oranges, mandarins, olives, they have good root systems, but they don't have invasive, very intense root systems. So they're not going to break into your pipes and crack it open and get it going. If you live in an older house and you may have septic or you may have the old 
um, ceramic sewage pipes don't grow any trees anywhere near your sewage system. The last thing you want to do because those things do leak slightly and um, that moisture plants, all plants will grow straight to it. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. All right, well, I'm pretty excited about our coming up guests. So Annie Razor Roland has co-authored a fantastic book that's really targeted to inspire kids, hopefully, to learn a little bit more about the environment they're in. Let's Eat Weeds. Good morning to you, Annie. How are you? Hey. It's lovely Can to you have you join, join us. Yes, it's great to be here. Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, it's a... It's actually a kid's version of an adult book that I co-authored with the same author, Adam Grubb, um, about 10 years ago now that mm -hmm. has been so incredibly popular that a publisher approached us and said, look, we hear that uh, kids keep stealing this book from their parents and going out into the garden with it. Can you write a kid-friendly version that's really easy for kids to understand language wise and that's got really good illustrations for helping kids to identify plants and we actually thought that was a great idea and couldn't believe we hadn't thought about ourselves so we got to it and this is the results i think you've got a copy there i sure do it's um, a fabulous it's a fabulous book here we go right here folks so you can see let's eat we let's eat weeds i, I often any when i'm talking to adults at um garden shows and uh, clubs and all those sorts of things talk about the different types of plants that you should be making sure you've got in your diet. And one that I always recommend people add into their diet is one that most people throw into their compost bin. It's portulaca. And yeah. it's a, class, a classic weed that you should be foraging and you should be putting it into your salads because it's one of the richest sources of antioxidants and specifically um, the... The omega fatty acids. Yeah. Very and that's one that's actually going to be coming up soon um, and loves a Mediterranean climate like we've mm. got here in WA. Um, I've travelled in Mediterranean countries around the world from Mexico to Portugal and people just treat it like it's one of the most common vegetables that you will get used, but no one bothers to grow it. You know, they just mm. forage. And that's kind of comes from the fact that in a lot of other cultures, people never gave up using wild plants in the way mm -hmm. that sort of those Anglo-Saxon cultures typically did. Um, yeah. So you get you know, those traditions of Greece and Mexico and Italy, France, all kind of kept their connection with eating the local wild plants alive. Um, I'm not really sure, well, there's complex reasons why other cultures sort of gave that up. But the fabulous thing is, is we've now got the internet and mingled cultures that give us the opportunity to rediscover some of those plants and how to use them. And Portulaca, otherwise known as purslane, people yep. might have heard of it called purslane, is a fabulous one. It's, and it sounds like you've got some pretty accomplished gardeners out there from just listening in. Mm -hmm. uh, they will recognise it. It grows in a basil rosette so it's like a flat doily shape on the ground when it's younger it will be coming up a little bit more and it's semi-succulent with little teardrop shaped leaves mm -hmm. and as it gets older the stems turn quite reddish and often pops up between cracks in pavers or in quite dry compacted areas mm. um yeah excellent one for this time of year that'll just be starting to come up soon so don't What's throw it out. Put it in a What's salad. the flavour like? It's crispy and tangy and tart. And lots mm -hmm. of cultures that use it cook it. I actually prefer it as a salad vegetable. Yeah, me too. Because it has got that crispy thing. And it's fabulous as an addition to any kind of a salsa. Say if you're putting like chopped up red onion and tomato and basil, then put a whole whack of purslane in there, chopped up nice and finely. This is one good thing to know about using wild greens is that hot tip, chop them up more finely than you would cultivated greens because mm. they haven't been bred to have softer and softer stems like our cultivated vegetables have. So often they'll have a slightly more fibrous or stringy stalk or stem to them. 
Mm -hmm. um, you get around that just by chopping them up really nice and yeah. finely. So and which is one of the reasons. One of the reasons a lot of people cook as well, obviously, with them is that they, when they're cooked, they obviously become a little bit uh, softer. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why it's probably just the easy solution. But of course, when you're cooking, a lot of the time you're losing a lot of those beneficial plant um, plant chemicals, yeah. right? Yeah. So lots of those, I mean, there's exceptions to that. I'm sure lots of listeners will know that say tomatoes, you actually get more of the nutrients from them if you do cook them a bit. But mm. yeah, for lots of your leafy greens, which most edible weeds are, um, you're going to get the biggest nutritional bang for your buck by so keeping it raw. And that's why green smoothies can be a great solution. Mm. Um, my standard and you know people are crazy about their nutri bullets and so on these days mm. and absolutely free superfood to chuck in that mix don't go buy spinach or whatever it's a total waste of your money kale mm. you've got absolute powerhouses of nutrition growing in the backyard like dandelion nettle milk thistle uh, sorry sour thistle purslane yep Chuck them in there instead. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that way that, that stringier stem just gets blended right up and you don't notice it. One of the things with bush foods is when they're grown in a cultivated environment, um, they often lose the intensity of goodness. And I think the same could be applied for many of the weeds that grow in gardens is that they have a greater intensity of goodness within them. So whether it be nutritional benefits or whether it be some of those um, beneficial plant chemicals that are so good for our bodies. Um, that's one of the reasons why you want to find ways to introduce these into your diet. What I think I love the most about what you guys have done with this book is that, you know, yourself, Adam and, and yourself, Annie, you guys have looked at this from the perspective of there was a period of time, uh, probably a decade ago, where I think we became a lot more conscious of foraging and we were seeing restaurants foraging mm -hmm. and bringing, bringing things onto the plate there. But this is really good for kids because it makes them more aware of what's actually in the environment they're living in. And, um, you know, we, we probably underestimate the, the complexity of our children's knowledge with regards to a lot of this stuff. But when we're only buying our food from supermarkets, they think food comes from supermarkets. Yeah. And that's not, that's not a good thing to think. We want them to think about what they can grow fresh at home or what they can forage. And so what you've done here is you've given them an, an opportunity. They take this book and we're scrolling through some of the pages as we speak. And this shows them not just the plants, but obviously shares with, you know, different ways to one harvest and two to actually use them. So it makes the kids so much more conscious of what's in the environment around them, which I, I think is a wonderful thing. You've done a great job. It's, it's really important, I think, for kids not to lose that connection. And I mean, it's a connection that lots of kids are getting through being involved in home vegetable growing, mm -hmm. but foraging is a whole nother level. And Lots of parents are quite fearful, understandably, of their kids getting into foraging, but you treat it as a supervised activity. Mm -hmm. And kids are actually natural foragers because they are so observant and have such a good eye for detail. And I've been astonished to see kids as young as three or four really mm -hmm. very quickly be able to grasp the difference between two quite similar looking weeds in mm. fast adults can because they yep. they do just have that full open to the world eyes sucking up information state of brain going on at that age where they really pick up stuff i mean i basically think if kids can recognize the difference between a pepsi logo and a coke logo they can yep. recognize as the difference between a dandelion and a rose bush without much trouble at all, you know. And and look, you, you know, it's it's a it's an important talent, I think, as a kid to be able to identify a mulberry tree from a hundred meters because you know you know you can be um, sitting up in that tree smothered in red yeah, juice in yeah. no time at all. That's for sure. Look, you know, you've done a great job. Thank you so much. Now, th this is available through good bookstores everywhere at the moment. It is, yep. Yep, just call your local bookstore. If they don't have it, they should have it and they'll be more than happy to get it in. Terrific. And who's the publisher? Uh, it's Scribble, which mm -hmm. is a kid's book publisher in Victoria. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, look, you've done an amazing job. I love uh, there's, there's a wonderful line um, at the end of your book that says, it's our sincere hope that this book ends up 
smeared with mud, stained with blackberry juice. Let's get foraging. And I think that's a, it's a great way to end the interview. Annie, thank you so much. You've done an amazing job and congratulations. Please pass on to Adam as well. I will. Thank you, Trevor. Have an excellent Christmas. And to you all do your the same. Too. Merry Christmas. All right. Well, look, what a wonderful gift for kids. If you haven't got, you know, or if you eat to be honest, if you're looking for that one more thing just to spoil them, what a great gift. Well done, Annie and Adam. That's a great idea. And certainly a very important um, message is, you know, teaching kids about the food that we've got um, uh, in our own backyards. Okay. All right. We are going to get back into your questions because we've got some interesting ones. The first one had me puzzled for a second. Not today has written into us on YouTube, which I need to remind you, you can do that via YouTube as well. Could you please advise where we can buy blueberry bushes in Perth other than Bunnings? All right, well, if uh, we're talking about in Perth, we're talking about Taz One Trees. Uh, they're located in um, in that sort of um, middle swan area. I'm going to take a rough guess. I'm pretty sure that's correct. And, um, of course, Walde <clears throat> Waldex or... Uh, the other one could be Dawson's. Both really reliable um, garden centres with great produce. So, um, and blueberries at the moment are magnificent. I must have harvested a kilo yesterday and maybe half a kilo of boysenberries from the garden. And uh, the, there's a lot of discussion about how they're going to be used over the next few days. So um, great thing to add in. Hopefully that helps not today. Matthew, we're not sure where you're from. My pop had a fig tree for 20 years. I took a cutting in one year. In, in better, looser soil, the cutting took over the 20-year-old tree. Okay, wow. So what you're basically saying is the cutting's taken off and um, it's out outrun the 20-year-old fig. It's a bit of an unusual thing. Now, if your pop's tree was a grafted tree and your cutting is a rootstock, you may not end up with the, the plant that um, that you hoped for. And it's not an uncommon thing for a rootstock to well and truly outgrow the, the parent plant, the plant you intend to be there. But um, uh, it's probably, it could be just that it's just landed in a better source of soil, a better source of nutrients, and of course, consistent moisture because figs will grow like crazy. Great uh, contribution, Matthew. Interesting observation. I would love to have a look at that if you get a chance take a photo and if you have got fruit off both trees is there a difference love to know that hopefully uh, me asking you some questions will help uh, help inspire you to learn a bit more about it as well christine is in sa hello christine i've got two little sarah magnolias okay um they're in medium-sized pots which have been flowering and getting new leaves now they've stopped flowering and started dropping leaves the leaves which are dropping are brown patches on them. Is this a fungus? If so, what should I spray them with? No, I don't think it is. I think if they're in medium-sized pots, they're due to go into a larger pot. Magnolias have quite an extensive root system. And when roots would normally grow on a plant, the, 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 the trunk would be like that, and the roots would grow out from the trunk flat across the surface of the soil. You might have some anchor roots that are a bit deeper, but the vast majority grow like that. So when you contain that in a pot, what happens is they grow out, they hit the side of the pot, they grow down the side of the pot. Now, the side of the pot, if it's plastic or if it's ceramic and it's in an exposed spot and it heats up, it's going to dry the fastest. And if it dries the fastest, those roots will stress. And the very first thing that the plant will do when it's in a dry environment is it'll start dropping its leaves. So I think that's exactly what's going on here, Christine. I think you need to put them into a really good potty mix, some of that Osmocote, Get the professional one, the one in the blue packaging for, for magnolias. It'll just deliver such amazing results. Don't spray them. Good soil, bigger pot. They'll be really happy. They might even produce some more flowers for you. John, we're not sure where you're from. Please, folks, tell us where you're from. It does help in answering your questions. I'm wondering what the best way is to deal with a yard full of weeds and very little lawn. Spray and get a machine to scratch the surface or move, or would there be a better option? I'm planning on vastly increasing lawn area and hedging. John, if you want to have a pristine single variety lawn, you're probably best to take those weeds out. Now, you could spray them out and you could also take the topsoil off. That's another option that would also work. But what I would suggest you do, um, if it's not a big deal, I would suggest you start mowing 
and mow three times a week on the lower setting. Because what's going to happen is any of the broadleaf weeds will be taken out straight away. though, And they won't be able to regrow or recover. Any lawn that's sitting underneath them, probably shaded out and struggling, is going to suddenly take off and start growing like crazy. And in a very short period of time, if you increase the water and fertilizer and your mowing ratio, and I'm saying probably three to six weeks, you will see quite a beautiful lawn start to emerge and all the weeds start to disappear. And it's a lot better than using sprays if you can help it. It really is. Okay, big question that got asked this week was about native plants. So a lot of native plants are still in flower, still producing, but they're starting to run out of energy. Remembering that they take their energy from nutrients that are in the soil. Those nutrients are predominantly minerals um, and those minerals need to be supplemented. So once they're taken out of the soil, the only way for them to go back is for that plant to die and for it to break down back in the soil, releasing some of them back into the soil. What's happening is people are sort of starting to express a bit of disappointment. My, my natives were growing strongly, they were producing lots of flower, and now they started to slow down. Now, there are many native varieties that are also phosphorus sensitive, okay? So you have to be very careful what fertilizer you use. And you don't want to use a fast acting fertilizer with natives because that could also cause a burn. So this is where this particular blend from the guys at Osmocote comes in so handy. And I wanted to show it to you because it's such an interesting blend of nutrients. And you can see the Osmocote in there. You can see all the other goodies in there. There is trace elements in there. This Osmocote is also a six month feed. So you only need to apply twice a year, but you do need to apply now is my message. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what natives, they're still in flower or if they have finished, they've used all this energy growing through what has been a pretty remarkable spring that sustained growth is not possible it will not continue on so you need to make sure that you've got the osmocote controlled release fertilizer and if you're going to grow them in pots use the potting mix as well make sure that you've got the right potting mix for these kinds of plants it's a really good way to get this really strong sustained growth you don't want to lose all the benefits of what you've got and right now we are seeing the effects of running out of energy so we're starting to see leaves getting a little bit of a limey green not a dark green starting to see dark green veins in the leaves if you're seeing any of those signs your plants are running out of energy it is time to boost it up and if you're thinking about natives you think well look i don't have to feed them they're a native plant they they can survive generally in in a natural bushland setting native plants are actually set a fair way apart from each other and they've grown and adapted to grow in an environment of, of, of I suppose low nutrient supply so if you are not um, on top of this if you're not careful with regards to feeding your natives in a home garden environment which is a lot more intensive your level of display is going to be a lot less does that make sense I hope so all right Shall we talk about our plant of the week? Because plant of the week, I should almost say that this is almost the problem of the week, okay? Because this is a bigger problem than, than anything. You can see these beautiful gladioli that I've got, the, the lovely dahlias. But what's going on here? I don't know if you can see it. Can you see the white streaks coming through, through the flowers? I'm going to show you right there. You see those white patches? Are you getting these on your gladdies? Are you finding that the flowers themselves are not lasting as long as they should or they've got burnt patches? And the dahlias are a classic. So beautiful white dahlia fading very quickly and then going to this dead flower. Look at those flower heads. Now, if you're deadheading these off and you're throwing them on the ground, you could be creating a bigger problem. What these guys are suffering from is thrip. Okay, and I wanted to show you what that looks like. Only trouble is, thrips are pretty much microscopic. So the way to demonstrate whether you've got thrips is a piece of paper and then just bang out on the piece of paper and you will see, and you can't see it because it's just, they're too small, but there's a few little, it's a little, what they look like, little pieces of pollen, but they're jumping around. And when I move around, they, they start jumping out the way. These are thrips. 
And there's two types of thrips that are really prominent right at the moment in my garden, the Western flower thrip, which was an introduced species, and another one called the chili thrip, which is another introduced species out of Asia. Both of these um, get into flowers and they generally get into the buds and they cause this damage. And um, it's really evident with the gladioli. So you can see the flowers, how much damage has been done to those beautiful flowers which is such a shame. Now, it's going to affect all the new buds coming out. And if you were to have a close look on the stem of the plant, you would see these little tiny bugs in there, and they are the thrips. So the, the real key is controlling thrips this time of the year. Now, they'll be in roses, they'll be in gladdies, they'll be in dahlias, they'll be in anything that's in flower because those soft flowers, that soft tissue of the petals, is a rich source of nutrient and, um, and energy for them. So how do you control them? Well, there's probably two ways. So there's the natural solution of getting some predatory mites. So head off to the Good Bug website. That's probably one of your first uh, sources of of um, controls and solutions that's a really easy way to to control it the second one um, that is really important i think is uh, to to think about maybe a chemical treatment this time of the year when you're seeing the damage done um it is so bad it is so bad that you need to treat the pest you can't not treat the pest so that's where something like um bathroid and the, the bathroid advanced which you can get in garden centers is a really good solution. How's that? Hopefully that helps solve that problem in your garden before it is a big problem. But yeah, I'm, I'm watching these little thrips running around on this piece of paper that I just banged them out on. Take the, take an A4 sheet of paper out into your garden, turn it over, bang a few flowers on there. If you're seeing them, treat with bathroid or alternatively get some predatory mites in now. Really important. Okay. It's not too late to get a great gift for somebody who you love who's a green thumb. And our friends at Garden Express have got an amazing offer. This is absolutely brilliant. So it's about vouchers, which can be delivered direct to your door. You can, little to your mailbox. You can literally print them out, pop them in, a, in an envelope with a card and send them off to somebody who you love. Or maybe you can just share it via an email. It's a really good way to do something like this. And you can save a fortune by doing this as well. So at the moment, they've got these gift vouchers that are um, significantly uh, discounted. And what I mean by that is that you can get a $60 gift voucher that's going to cost you just $50, 20% off, and send that through to somebody who you love. Now, it's a really good way to do it. A $60 for, for $50, you can get a $120 gift voucher for just $100 or a $180 gift voucher for $150. It's such a good deal. And it's a very simple way to actually raise, I suppose, um, you know, to, to raise yourself some, uh, some wonderful gifts without necessarily having to leave the house. And some of us still want to stay inside. It's fully understandable. Now, the great thing to, to, about this, of course, is that you have um, had a, a really, really good lot of deals this year from Garden Express. And if somebody's got a Garden Express, um, a, you know, a, a, an intent to buy bulbs from Garden Express and they can get 60 bucks worth, in, uh, you know, which would normally be 50 bucks worth, it's a better deal. I think it's a great deal. So if you want to get your hands on this, head to gardenexpress.com.au. Uh, David and, and Rowan and all the team, they're still there. And this is something that they can turn around straight away for you. You don't have to wait for delivery. This can be delivered direct into your inbox. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can take advantage of that for a gift for yourself, maybe, or maybe just for somebody who you love. All right, well, we've had a wonderful series of The Garden Gurus this year. It's been great. We've really had some great stories. Here's a little bit of a wrap-up of what you saw this series.
If I had a favourite, um, I would tell you that it's probably those those beautiful native animal stories we did with the help of the team at Cavisham Wildlife Park. It's great to create an environment where you can have things like echidnas come into your backyard. And, um, and it is possible. It's just a case of giving them food sources and making sure that they've got the protection that they need. So they were great stories. Remember, you can always go back and have a look at past episodes from the series on our YouTube channel. And of course, there's a lot of information on our social media and also our website. So make sure you check it. Um, Jan Morrissey, who joins us on a regular basis, sent in a lovely comment. Thank you so much for your TV show, but especially this Facebook session. You're an inspiration to us all. Thank you for your time. Merry Christmas, Jan. Thank you. That's very kind of you. It's my absolute pleasure to be involved. And I know that through the season, we've had a number of other people, um, you know, who have been making this contribution and we all feel the same. It's such a great mechanism to interact with people and give you a chance to ask your questions. So it's our, our pleasure and our privilege. And Merry Christmas to you too, Jan. Now, Vipin is in Melbourne. Hello, Vipin. You've come to us on YouTube. I'm struggling with birds digging our soil and exposing our gardenia roots, unfortunately killing a few. Any suggestions would be truly appreciated. You've got to think about why the birds are doing it. I would think that that's probably an indication that you've got curl grub in the soil and they're scratching that soil up looking for those grubs, not intending to expose the gardenia roots, but gardenias do have quite... Um, a fragile root system, to be quite honest. They are quite sensitive. So what I would be suggesting you do is get a big, thick layer of mulch, like 100 mil deep, and put that over the top of the... Sorry about that. Over the top. And um, what you're doing is you are creating an environment for um, the curl grub to come to the surface to get into that, that organic material. But most importantly, you are also providing... Um, a protection for those roots so even if they're digging the mulch up it doesn't really matter um, i think birds in the garden are a very important thing they do eat most of the pests that can cause quite serious problems so i wouldn't be getting rid of them i would be putting lots and lots of uh, beautiful big thick chunky compost on top of the soil hopefully that ha helps Pippin. staying in victoria hello tyson tyson's a a great a follower of ours and supporter throughout the season. Thank you for your support. Can I put beetroot seeds in my garden bed? Can you please give me some tips and advice? Yes, you can. Um, one of the interesting things with beetroot is that um, if, you, if you've if you got a rich composted sort of soil, try and put a layer, a string, if you like, of, of clean sand across the top and plant your seeds into the clean sand. They much prefer that to get germinated. And once they can get their feet down or their roots down into that really good organic soil, they take off and grow like crazy. So hopefully that solves that particular problem, Tyson. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting challenge getting beetroot off to a good start. Um, once you've got them down too, you can you can quite put them in little clumps. We can spread them out as well. Wait until they've germinated, and then you can do that. Hopefully that helps a little bit. And of course, remember when you've um, when you've done any transplanting, give them a good drench with sea salt. It does help reduce transplant shock. Margaret. Now, we're not sure where you're from, Margaret, but what TLC do I give my rose to bloom profusely? Well, the TLC is simply giving it food. Um, it's really the key. I've, I've got that fertilizer again. I'm going to show it to you one more time. Designed specifically to encourage strong root growth. This is what, sorry, strong flower which is what roses really want to be doing right at the moment, but they need that energy. So it's uh, Osmocote for roses, gardenias, azaleas, and it's pretty darn good for camellias and even good for figs. If you haven't, haven't put some of this around your figs, give it a try. might help. I hope that does help. Okay, let's head to Falcon in WA, which is just south of Perth. Terry's got a question. Any tips for dealing with rats destroying our green tomatoes and nectarines? Well, rat traps are the key this time of the year, okay? So they it's unusual that they're so um, attracted to green tomatoes, but, of course, they will eat any fruit. And I've seen them eat out lemons. I've seen them attack all sorts of things when they're in plague proportions. Don't bait them. If you can avoid baiting, it's a lot better than, than uh, traps. There are a lot of great, very humane traps out there that can uh, get rid of those rats. Um, I would head into my local Bunnings store. They've probably got one of the best um, selections of the various 
rat control options you need, but you do need to get acting pretty quick because um, you're only just coming into tomato season and nectarines and you don't want to lose them. Michelle is in Adelaide. Hello, Michelle. My gardenia leaves are yellowing and falling. What can I do to help it? It is in a pot with morning sun and afternoon shade. All right. Well, this is a pretty classic sign of the energy in the soil running out. Now, you can feed it. My recommendation, however, is take it out, gently tease the roots apart, maybe get the hose and wash some of the soil away and repot it into some really good potting mix. And I promise you, you'll get this massive flush of dark green foliage and it'll take off and it'll look healthy again. That's the key. Peter is in Brisbane. Hello, Peter. We've got strawberries in a pot, but they're getting overripe whilst they are only very small. What might be causing it? What's causing it is that the variety you've got is a smaller fruiting variety. It's not one of the larger ones. You're going to need to, to grow other varieties because there's no way that um, they're going to ripen small um, unless it's meant to be that particular variety. It's very unusual. So, Peter, I suspect that it's the strawberry variety, not anything you can do. So maybe just pick them small. Usually those smaller ones have a lot more intense flavour and fragrance. So hopefully that's a good thing. Lorraine. Hello, Lorraine. Uh, we're not sure where you're from. I, I should remember Lorraine, but I can't remember off the top of my head. How do I stop stock roots coming through on my apple and peach trees below the graft? I mentioned this earlier on, actually. Um, so any grafted plants, if they're going to sucker, they'll start suckering now. So that root stock. So when, when you buy a fruit tree or a rose, they've been grafted uh, onto a root stock. The scion, the scion is the is the bottom bit, that join bit there. The plant above you want to grow with no competition from anything else. The root stock is far more vigorous, which is why it's been grafted on. So this, if it's putting all its energy into there, will make this grow just like this one would look. But if this gets some suckers out, then it will overtake and smother and you'll end up with a, well, a lesser plant. And certainly when it comes to rootstocks or fruit trees, something that's not going to taste very good at all. What you need to do is not cut them, but is to grab them and pull them away. If you grab them and pull them away, you will blind all the buds and it'll stop doing it. You can mulch up around the outside and that will reduce that because you're not getting as much sunlight to roots that are near the surface, which is where those buds are coming from. But you do have to pull them away. And it goes for roses and it goes for uh, for things like apples, peaches, nectarines, even the citrus. So hopefully that helps. Joy is in Tassie. Great to have you join us from Tassie. Comment about weeds. We're trying to get foxgloves declared a weed as it's becoming a huge problem, escaping from gardens into bush and pristine wilderness. Joy, it's a really interesting problem. It's a bit like um, sort of places in New South Wales where things like agapanthus are actually quite a problem because they can move out of the garden. Um, certain plants are just not meant to be in certain places, which is why states have individual agriculture departments and they have their individual declared weed lists. So I would keep doing that work. If they're moving outside, you don't want them moving into pristine wilderness. Part of the reason is they're going to compete with native plants. But secondly, is foxgloves, the seed of the foxglove is actually not something that you ever want somebody coming in contact with because it's quite toxic. So hopefully uh, that helps. All right. Now, folks, don't forget, if you like what I'm talking about, if you're enjoying today's session, do us a big favour. Hit the like button. It really does make a big difference to us. It certainly lets us know that you, you like what we're doing. But most importantly, um, it, it also shares with your friends and they can participate as well. So thank you. All right, uh, Joe, how often should I water trust tomato plants, please? Well, typically in a uh, commercial environment, they would be watered two to three times a day, which is a lot, right? It is. You could probably get away with one watering a day. That's a hand watering because typically these plants are really producing huge amounts of fruit at the moment. And uh, mine at home, they get watered three times a week. And on a very hot day, I will go in and I will give them a, uh, a bit of a supplementary hand water. But um, trust tomatoes generally do require that daily water, just as a general comment. Hopefully that helps. Joe. and you didn't let us know where you were, but I was lucky because that was an easy one to answer. Every once in a while, something is really uh, climate or location specific, and I do need to be aware of that. So please let us know. Christy's written in. She hasn't told us where she's from either, but she's asked a question where... A fruit tree is planted near grass. What's the best thing to feed grass so it's not failing, please? 
I'm not really sure why you would be concerned about that unless you think it's going to affect the fruit tree. Um, to be quite honest, feed, feed your, your grass with a slow release lawn fertilizer. We've come a long way with lawn fertilizers. Um, there is no doubt Lawn Builder is one of, if not the absolute best options you can have. So that's, that'll only feed your grass, feed it nice and slowly. It's got a really nice slow release nitrogen in it. And your fruit trees, they need to be fed with something completely different. So that mix, try and keep them apart if you can. That mix is um, one of those things where you, you do need to make sure that you're encouraging flower and fruit growth um, with your fruit trees this time of the year. Once they've finished fruiting, giving them a good all-round general uh, feed is going to help them an awful lot as well. Cherie is another great supporter of uh, ours. Uh, you're in Bunyip in Victoria. Thank you so much for your contribution throughout the, the year. It's been absolutely brilliant. You'd like some advice on your fiddly fig. A few months ago, it had scale. I've treated it. it seems to be gone now. It's quite tall and it's lost several leaves from the bottom. Just tried notching, never done it before. How would it be? How long would it be before I see new shoots? And how do I know if I've succeeded? Cherie, great, great question. So notching, so you know a, a trunk grows up like this and once the, the, the plant will keep producing growth at the top, but you end up with all this, this trunk underneath. Now, if you can notch in a little, uh, a little cut into the bark, um, if there's any buds below that and you've slowed the... Well, you've stopped the movement of, of sap beyond the bud. So the bud's there, the, the, the notch is here. All the goodness that's going up into here, even though you can't even see the bud, what will happen is the sap will come up here and it'll push that bud out and the plant will generally recover around the notch and continue up. There won't be any effect on any of the foliage above. But what you will end up with is lots of, obviously, lots of little shoots start to emerge around where the notch is and if you do one on this side and then further down you do one on that side and further down you do maybe another one on this side you'll end up in a situation where you'll get multiple buds coming up and the ideal scenario is once they start to burst out cut the top plant off and take literally take cuttings of that put those down into new pots into new soil and they should drop roots and grow this time of the year hopefully that all made sense it um there's a lot going on there, obviously, and we need to think carefully about how we um, how we go about doing these things. But that notching um, is a great way to encourage new bud growth. Great question. Thank you very much. Theta is in Brisbane. Hello, Theta. I used to have heaps of mango fruits over the years, but this month I only have one or two fruit. What would you suggest so I'll have more fruit again next summer? I reckon it's feeding, Theta. Um, Mangoes need to have lots of new fresh growth and when they've got new fresh growth, they'll produce flowers from it. And as a tree ages, sometimes they'll start becoming what they call biennial bearers. So every second year or so, they do sort of produce new growth and you'll get lots of flower and a good crop. Then they'll almost rest again. So that's kind of the, the following year, it's like a resting period. So what I would suggest you do is definitely have a think about um, giving them a good feed and it won't hurt to feed them while this fruits on the on the plant as well just make sure that it's getting good uh, good moisture at the same time uh, vipin's jump back on via the youtube channel hello vipin could you please advise the best wi-fi tap timer in the marketplace we like the holman wx1 tap timer and the wi-fi hub any other suggestions i love the wx1 i've got one of my own i use it inside i've got an atrium and i've got all uh, tropical indoor plants in that environment. I've got a misting system and it waters the whole lot and it's Wi-Fi, so it's automatic. And I can control it from anywhere in the world simply off my phone, literally using the app. It's it's absolutely brilliant. So I, I don't know um, I don't know anything else that I currently feel. So that's what it kind of looks like. You can see, I'll just have to pull that straight up, but I can adjust the time that it runs, the days, all sorts of options you've got. So if it starts raining and I want to turn it off, I can do it remotely. I could be on a holiday on the beach in Queensland or maybe on Kangaroo Island and I can literally press a button, bang, turn it off and or turn it on if I want extra water because I know it's hot and dry. So that's the Holman WX1 tap timer. Brilliant idea, Wi-Fi. 
um, technology has taken us such a long way in such a short period of time. Kirsten, I'm not sure where you're from. Your gardenias have yellow leaves, which are falling off easily. What am I doing wrong? They're lacking magnesium sulfate. That's one of the things. Gardenias love iron. They love magnesium. And that's why you get those specialized fertilizers. I, I showed this earlier on. This is one of those fertilizers. It's got very high levels of iron, magnesium, manganese, all those really important um, nutrients for gardenias. The first thing your gardenia will do as the leaves start to yellow is drop, is, is, sorry, as the, is the plant starts to run out of energy is to, to yellow those leaves and drop them off. The only other cause of that can be sometimes a situation where we have a, um, uh, a drying environment and the plant's starting to shock and that again will shed leaves. Uh, I suspect if you increase your water, give it some good fertilizer, you'll see your gardenias turn around pretty quickly. Karen is in Perth in WA. Hello, Karen. Where and when can I purchase the plant? Leucospermum yellow, please. All right, there's a few different types of leucospermums. The gold is probably um, one of the rarer ones. I'd be heading into your local Wallex store. Um, they definitely have them. I, I think Bunnings would probably have them. You tend to find those proteas are a little more specialised. Um, but yeah, it's certainly your local Waldex Garden Centre has got to be able to either either has them or will be able to get them for you. And they have a, a wide range of those proteaceous plants. So yeah, check it out. One more question, and it's from here, from home for me in Perth. It's Cathy. What could my what could cause my bottle brush not to flower? Kathy, it's a great question, and the answer is too much love. Be giving it lots of water and lots of, of high nitrogen fertilizer. That's the kind of fertilizer you normally apply to a lawn. It's highly likely that your bottle brush will just grow, not flower, and I reckon that's what's going on. If it looks thick, lush, and healthy, back off the water, back off the nutrient, and it will continue producing lots and lots of flower. Got one more comment. Theta's come back, says, thanks heaps, Trevor. Have a lovely Christmas to you, your family, and the whole team at Gurus. Thank you so much. Looking forward to next year's wonderful tips on TV and Facebook. And that is the perfect way to say goodbye to you for this year. Thanks, Theta. That's really very much appreciated. Merry Christmas to you. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you so much for your support. This was one of those innovations that we brought about as a consequence of COVID impacting our business, we wanted to make sure that we kept everybody employed, that we kept talking to people who were following us and who were looking for help. And um, our Facebook Live uh, has just grown and grown and grown. And it's your chance to get your questions answered. Uh, we're very fortunate to have young Robin who is producing today, which has been brilliant. And Jimmy is driving the technical side as he always does so well. They've done a great job and Lockie throughout the year has done an amazing job as well producing. So thanks very much to the team. Um, Robin's going to be sending a message to our seed winners and our book winner. What a great book. Don't forget about that one. If you've got grandkids, kids, even if you've got friends who've got kids and you want them to grow up and be more in touch with nature, that's a great book and it's in local bookstores right now. There'll be somebody who wins one of them and Robin will get that off to them today. The Garden Gurus has finished now for the year, There's the TV series, and uh, we are going to take a bit of a well-earned break. We are planning to be back at the end of February, which is really exciting, but keep your eye on our social media. So. Uh, our, uh, you, uh, our Facebook and, of course, our Instagram will have updates on where we're at. And, of course, we'll keep sharing information. Now, don't worry about not seeing us because I'm back the 10th of January, which is going to be great. We will start with our first session of the Garden Gurus Live in the new year. It'll be 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Of course, in WA, that's 9 a.m. Remember, if you want any information ever, We've always got these great resources for you, like our website, and it's an amazing resource full of videos, fact sheets, all sorts of links to wonderful garden products or garden information, something you should use, something you should have on call all the time and just use it to help you get a better garden. If you want to see some previous stories from the Garden Gurus TV show, visit our either, you can check it out actually on the website, but you can also go to our YouTube channel where you can watch programs there, thegardengurus.tv. You can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify podcast, that's Apple podcast and Audible. And look, thank you so much for your support from all the team here at The Garden Gurus. We want to wish you a very 
wonderful, safe, happy Christmas New Year period. Hopefully we will see you again really soon. Happy gardening, everybody. Merry Christmas. This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.